this and a lot of people have been watching Big Brother we're obviously talking about it now when this is the type of blood cancer that I'd never heard about I mean it is incredible isn't it really what it would do to raise awareness for people for sure and I think it's really important because I think quite often people watch these programs and it can be a little bit silly and mm -hmm. arguments and stuff but actually when someone that's got a lot of media attention like Lou Walsh mm -hmm. talks about this a lot of people start mm -hmm. to think you know cancer research do a lot of good work I'm not shocked that he's doing that he's, he's a very marmite figure you know mm. uh, you know a lot of us have seen what jedward have been saying about lou walsh behind the scenes you mm. know he's a very kind of a lot of people say he's quite a nasty figure oh. you know he's been in the show business a long time he knows how to get certain people to do certain things and i think he's um he's great for the program though because you know that's what we want right we want reality tv to be exactly how it is you know mm. so that's actually one I'm thing sure. that i've uh, thought in terms of casting for celebrity big brother they did a really good job yeah, in getting sharon and Louis, Louis in there. We're getting all the Hollywood gossip, yeah. you know, who they like, who they don't like. And I think Simon that's been the other great. Day. That was good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is he a colourful character? Colourful, yes. That's how you But just... when you said he's like Marmite, you've got to think, you can put a bit of Marmite in your bolognese and it tastes good. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. It's 11 o'clock, you're with GP News and in a moment headliners. But first, let's bring you up to date with the latest developments in the United States, where President Biden has this evening pledged his full federal support to the Baltimore Bridge rescue operation. Video footage captured the moment a freight ship stacked high with containers crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge at around 1.30 this morning local time. The collision plunged cars, their drivers and construction workers into the water below with no warning. We now know the vessel involved in today's crash was reported to have structural issues in 2016 and was involved in a separate accident when it hit a port wall in Belgium in the same year. Showing you these live scenes now coming to us from Baltimore in Maryland in the States, where those six construction workers who reportedly stopped more traffic coming onto the bridge at the time of the collapse have reportedly been recorded as missing. The governor of Maryland says it is, though, still very much an active search and rescue mission. We'll try and keep you up to date on the latest events from Maryland tomorrow on GP News. Here at home, chemical attacker Abdul Azidi was granted asylum by a judge who accepted that he was a Christian convert despite concerns the sex offender was a proven liar. A range of confidential court documents have shown today the lengths that Azidi went to to prove his conversion from Islam, including signing an agreement to be escorted during Christian church services as a result of his criminal past. Meanwhile, pictures also released for the first time today show him being baptised and handing out Christian leaflets in a shopping centre. Azidi's body was pulled from the River Thames last month amid a major manhunt after he was suspected of dousing his ex-girlfriend with a corrosive chemical. The London mayor has today condemned a Conservative Party advert, calling it an attempt to mislead voters. Here's part of the video that suggested London had become the crime capital of the world under Sadiq Khan's leadership. A 54% increase in knife crime since the Labour mayor seized power has the metropolis teetering on the brink of chaos. Well, the video also warned of what it described as squads of ULEZ enforcers terrorising communities at the beck and call of their Labour master. The post was withdrawn after a backlash for using footage of a stampede in a New York, not London, subway station. It's now been replaced, but without those scenes. And it comes as the Conservative Susan Hall is set to challenge Sadiq Khan in the upcoming London mayoral election on the 2nd of May. A former British museum curator has been ordered by the High Court to return stolen artefacts within four weeks. 
Dr Peter Higgs, who was dismissed for misconduct, faces allegations of theft and damage to over 1,800 historical items, accusations he denies. The courts also ordered Mr Higgs disclose records from his eBay and PayPal accounts, following claims he listed hundreds of the stolen items online for sale. HMS Prince of Wales has returned to her home port of Portsmouth Harbour. It's after leading the largest NATO exercise since the Cold War, exercise Steadfast Defender. The British warship was at the centre of a maritime mission involving more than 20,000 UK military personnel across Scandinavia and Northern Europe. For the very latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Time now for Headliners. Hello and welcome to Headliners, uh, your first look at Wednesday's newspapers. I'm your host, Andrew Doyle. I'm joined by two top-tier comedians. It's Josh Howey and Cressida Wetton. Very exciting to have you both here. Are you well? It's good, man. Very well. I've been Very... doing some, like, I've been wood-filling uh, the, uh, the, my window sills and then fighting with Andy Seamots online. And then <laughs> okay, going back that, to Woodford, that's my day. Your two favourite things in the world. That's it, just going like, oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the one is therapy for the other. But you yeah. mean, Cressida, you don't get on in these online squabbles. You avoid all of that. I you rise above it. I do my best. Yeah. Your only fan not... Oh, brilliant. But is that... Straight away. Sorry. If we that... had an HR... Dep... No, um... Well, at least you didn't we mention do. mine. Yes. Because it's very niche, <laughs> let me tell you. Very niche, but do subscribe. Very intellectual. Uh, right, uh, let's have a look at Wednesday's front pages first. So the Telegraph is leading with churches undermining asylum system. The Guardian has CBI stops staff discussing sexual misconduct and bullying claims. The I is leading with state pension age may rise to 68 sooner to pay for triple lock pledge. The Daily Mail is leading with Clapham, Clapham chemical attacker asylum fiasco. And the Financial Times has Trump's social media group TMTG jumps 50% on, on Nasdaq market debut. And the Mirror, front cover on Wednesday, traitors, the Brits fighting for Putin. Those were your front pages. Right, we're going to begin with the Daily Mail. Josh, you have the details. Yes, Clapham chemical attacker asylum fiasco. And this is a fiasco. Mm -hmm. This was, uh, if people remember, a few months ago, the guy, he uh, did an acid attack in yes. Clapham on the, uh, the mum and her two daughters. Absolutely horrific. Horrific. Supposedly he's died in the Thames. And, uh, but then it turns out that he'd... Was a pre he was a sex offender. He'd been rejected twice, yes. uh, his asylum claim, and then on the third time he was let through because he now said that he was a Christian. Uh, right, so people are going to be justifiably angry about this. Absolutely, but there's a few things that make me even more angry. Yeah. The first is that the guy who basically spoke up for him, uh, and he, he failed some tests on Christianity, they basically said um, what they, he had a Christianity test and uh, they were like, you know, like trick questions, like was Jesus Muslim? Uh, 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 that wasn't one that, of the questions, but uh, I, I don't know but, how he but, would have But, but you know, if you, if you weren't a Christian, you might get that wrong. You might. Well, well, he thought the Old Testament was about Jesus. He'd probably say Jesus was a Christian, but of course he was Jewish. Yes, of so course. So yeah. actually it is quite a hard question. Yeah. So, uh, and um, anyway, the big thing is that this guy, Reverend Merrin, yes. who was the guy who, who spoke up for him and essentially was, was what the judge said, oh, well, if he, I'll take this guy's word for yes. it. Yes. Turns out they knew he was a sex offender. They knew he was wrong. At their church, they had kind of a special schedule for people to chaperone in so he wasn't around anyone that he would grope or anything yeah. like that. But what? So you think that's OK f to protect your par parishioners or whatever, but not the general public? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely outrageous. I mean, I suppose they might have been going along the line of that belief in redemption, that belief in forgiveness, and that people can change and move on. I don't know much about Which Christianity. Is well, it's, it's kind of it's essential what, to there, it. it? I... Um, uh, but, you know, you're not de you are dealing with bigger issues here. You're dealing with other people's lives, and you shouldn't really make that decision, that, well, that's that call. A, then the, the contract between... 
I find that a bit ludicrous anyway to have this contract. You will behave, won't you? Yes, yeah. I will. Fine. Um, but that, as you said, that's only applicable while he's at church. Yes. That says nothing about what he's doing the rest of the time. I mean, this is a broader problem, isn't it, Cresto? Is a lot of people are supposedly pretending to convert yeah. in order to secure asylum. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people who will tell and weave various stories in order to ensure that they get what they want when it comes to this. I'm not saying there aren't legitimate asylum claims. Of course, there are loads. Yeah. No. Well, but I'm starting to think Lewis Schaefer isn't Christian. <laughs> I re that would make some sense, yes. But, but how do you actually prove that someone hasn't converted to Christianity in this particular case? How do you do that? Well, that's that's very difficult, but that's I know, not... I know. Just draw, you've got to draw a picture of Mohammed. Oh, Josh, Josh. Harry. No, no, you've got to draw, draw a cartoon. Where in the Bible does it say you've got to... But no, I'm just that, saying, that, if, that, it, if it's no, people a better, from... A, 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 a better Islamic. test would be to explain the Trinity. That would okay. be a better... Or explain, no one can do that. Or explain transubstantiation. Go. I'm very. I know a lot about trans issues, but <laughs> that, that, that's one element. But that, none of that's uh, the uh, point, is it? Because because it, that's fine to let him in the church and have his yeah. behaviour agreement, and that's all great. But the point is that they use that that so-called evidence of Christianity to yeah. allow him to stay, and under other circumstances, he wouldn't have been allowed. And should to it be stay. the case that we have a zero policy when it comes to asylum claims? If you've committed any crime at all, actually. Yes, of course. Why do we? Why would we want people who've committed crimes? But well, certainly, because sex you might offenses. have a top yeah. doctor who's got a parking ticket. I mean, you've got to have boundaries, haven't you? To, that you wouldn't. No, we don't want a bad parking ticket doctor. <laughs> we want a doctor. <laughs> but but so James Clo our, our, the Home Secretary, has basically been meeting with church officials mm. to say sort it out or stop doing it. Mm -hmm. now, now, Justin Welby the other day said he was asked on a podcast something, had he seen uh, evidence? He said, oh, I hadn't seen any evidence of this. Well, here's the evidence. The government's yeah. seen the evidence. Yeah. And stop it. Yeah. Well, and historically, the idea was you didn't want to send people back to dangerous situations. So it feels like the, the safe option is, oh, let them stay. And this proves, no, there is no safe option. It's got no. to be each case on its merit. OK, right. Well, let's move on to the front cover of Wednesday's Telegraph now. Cressida, what are they leading with? They are leading... Uh, well, they've got the church's story uh, as well. And they've also got uh, two-thirds of magistrates' cases are being held behind closed doors. So we covered this yesterday briefly. Um, so, yeah, nearly two-thirds of magistrate court cases are being held in secret. OK, um, now, what's the oh, rationale behind it? To speed it up, I suppose? I think so. I think it's a budget issue, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, of course. It's like one person, you can do things really quickly. We talked about 90-second cases. You know, tell me what the facts, I'll tell you quickly. But yes. the problem is this happens a lot to vulnerable people who don't even... They're not even there sometimes. Isn't there a risk of exploitation as well? I mean, we have the principle of open justice, right. transparency, etc. Isn't that a risk here? Yeah, yeah of course it is, yes. And so uh, there are people are going to fall back but between the cracks, uh, they're talking about now putting journalists in there, although yeah. I don't know how a journalist is really going to get in 90 seconds a story. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Howey, <laughs> tell us about this other story, NHS. Yes, uh, NHS satisfaction at the lowest ebb uh, amid long waits and lack of GPs. This is also on the front of the Telegraph. Yes, people are not banging their pots anymore, at least not oh. in a nice way. Uh, Yes, so f it's now basically about a quarter of people are satisfied with the health service. And, and well, it's pretty bad. I mean, the waiting lists are pretty much out of control. I mean, to the extent that it's dangerous, you know, these a people need for a treatment. GP appointment. Oh, I mean, I yeah. you forget about it. You have to phone at, at a precise time early in the morning, or, or just you can't, you can't do it. You have to go to Booper. Yeah, um, Cressida. Thoughts. This is the number one election issue, apparently. Yeah, so yeah. it matters. Um, they've asked people for the first time if they'd be prepared to pay more tax uh, to in improve this, and yes. half of people have said they would. Yeah, I think I think the NHS is, you know, still very much a big deal in this country. I think people re really do care about it, and think, I think they understand the, the necessity for it. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that but people aren't we would... paying lots of tax for it already? Isn't that what we are paying our tax towards? We are, but maybe the tax isn't being distributed in the correct way. Maybe the NHS could get more if we didn't spend on it. Well, also thing. maybe the money's not being spent in the right way because there's another part of this thing that says they have eight billion. The whole point of the NHS yeah. is they can buy, bulk buy. And eight billion that they spend, they they spend it individually on stuff. So yes. they're not using the service for no, the most efficient way. No, there is an administrative problem within the NHS which they do need to address. But there's also the issue of suing. A lot of people sue the NHS, and so much of their budget goes on lawsuits. Now, inevitably, that's going to happen when when there's when the things go wrong. Um, but isn't there something we can do about that? I don't know what right. the answer is. There. Be better. Be better well, no, doctors. but if it was a business, they <laughs> would be really interested in their mistakes, wouldn't they? You capture your mistakes, you learn mm. from them, and so on. Yes. And I, I wouldn't like to say whether that's the case. No, because the there's NH lots of stories of them hiding it. Right. Uh, frank frankly, uh, the other thing is we've got an issue of lack of staff, and we do. then we have brings the. Let's talk about immigration.
Yep, OK, or let's not. Let's move on to the Mirror instead. Front cover of Wednesday's Mirror. Cressida, you have this. OK, traitors, the Brits fighting for Putin. Imagine that. Um, the Mirror today exposes two British traitors who've gone to fight in the Ukraine uh, for Russia. Uh, and is that I them mean, on the front? Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. I mean, that is no, not... No, it's Putin. That's oh, not... Oh, sorry, yeah. The other one, yeah, yeah. He's not fighting, is no, he? No. He's, he's sat in his... That's throne. a permanent choice, isn't it? You're not yeah. coming back from that. That's... Uh... One of those yeah. guys has got COVID. He's wearing a mask. Yeah, OK. Or at least he doesn't want other people to catch it. Which is quite considerate. So, it's, so he's a traitor, but he's a considerate traitor. Mercenary traitor. traitor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what can you say? I mean, you know, it's 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 not good being a traitor, is it? I think I'm going to no. stick my neck. No, I know a traitor. I knew one. Uh, he was an on the open mic circuit. Huh? Uh, <laughs> Russell. Some, uh, I knew him like this is like 20 years ago. Uh, well, and what, and uh, who did he? No, he went out and he he started reporting from the Ukraine, but like the Dunbar, the, the the captured region. Really? Yeah, and he became like a full on propagandist for Putin. And he's a comedian. Well, he was a comedian. Yeah. Well, to be fair, most most comedians in this country are propagandists in one way or another. Exactly. But he was like, oh, but he was. Was like on the open mic circuit, no, it's just mental. Yeah, it's just a lot of mental. At first, yeah. I thought this was a Zelensky joke, and then I thought it was something about joke theft. No, you're just telling you're us saying, an anecdote. Just tell you a story. Something, something it's actually just happened. happened through, yeah. Okay. Point is that they're out there. They are out there, the crazy people. Luckily, it's all sanity here at GB News. So that's the first section done. Stay tuned as we delve further into the papers in a few moments. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here or is it more about the toothbrush? Because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night, you're going to be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. You're exactly right, yeah. There is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually, what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over-scrub and over-brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back to Headliners, your first look at Tuesday's newspapers. I'm Andrew Doyle. I'm still here with Josh Howie and Cressida Wetton. Let's continue with the stories now. We're going to stick with The Telegraph. This is a story about free speech, my favourite subject, Cressida. Your favourite. Well, one of them, apart from origami and badminton. And, this is uh, my favourite subject. And Shakespeare. Ancient Shakespeare. things. OK, universities told to protect free speech from foreign state attacks. Uh, so this comes from Professor Arif Ahmed, the government's free, free speech czar. Lovely guy. I've met him. Um, really right. nice guy. Right. I yep. can imagine you'd be mates. Actually. He invited he's... me to Gonville and Keys to do a talk, and uh, he's a great guy. Did you go? Didn't I did. I did. Didn't get any protesters, disappointingly. Oh, That's next wanted, time. Really. Next time. Well, so he's, he's making moves to say to universities, you've got to be wary that if you have lots of people from other cultures who might not respect our strong free speech values. Yes. You can't be justifying it. Just if, if the university is full of people with different values, you've got to take action. And this is coming uh, in the wake of the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill from May last year, which is putting the emphasis on the university yeah, to I mean, make sure. It was always difficult for me because I always thought, you know, it sounds weird imposing free speech with a rule, <laughs> with a law, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, you have to have that principle. And there were so many student bodies and, and unions who were basically yeah. no platforming or just Ka not inviting. Kathleen or... Stock being handed yeah, off campus. You know, well, I know, it's thing. amazing they had to implement this rule yeah. because like, you'd, you'd think the whole point of universities was free thinking, discussion, uh, engagement with different issues you might not agree with. It still is for a lot of students. I have to be you know, defend them. I would say that part of this story is because we have so much foreign investment now, yeah, either yeah. directly... China, Qatar, money uh, in, uh, into certain departments, but also so many uh, students, that, foreign students, that we li we need their money. These universities were closed down without... Well, they pay a lot more than domestic foreign students. student money, yeah. So if someone's going to start... Uh, you were saying earlier about talking about the Uyghurs... Yeah. Uh, ..and if then some Chinese students are going to get offended by it and say, no, we're either, that, that's one of them. The thing that's not covered in this article, though, is self-censorship. Right, yeah, yeah. Not about... Nothing to do with the influence of... Of money, but the, but to do with American identity politics and postmodernism coming over here over the last 20, 30 years, yeah. and how that has had a detrimental impact on free speech. You're right to mention that because every Thank study. You. Well, uh, you are sometimes right. A bro <laughs> you know, broken clock and all that. But what I would say, Josh, is that every study into this shows that people routinely self-censor on university campuses, in particular, more than other places. And we're talking about yeah. not just the students who are scared of what their friends think, but the staff. I mean, when I gave my talk at Convent and Keys the week before, Helen Joyce had given a talk in the same room in the same college. There were people banging drums and all sorts of stuff. They had to sneak students in because they were terrified of being seen by their other student, you know, peers yeah. Yeah. and being demonised as a result. And, and we've had studies saying that staff who are right-leaning censor their own opinions. This is absolutely not what a university is about, is it? No. I mean, it can't be like this. How do we change the culture then? Because you can't change self-censorship by force. You have to kind of just encourage a more well, I open... Think what they're trying to do is to sort of create <laughs> create a safe space. Ha, ha, ha. Mm. Um, but really, that's what it's... And I, but I, I don't think that gets around the problem of self-censorship no. immediately. I mean, maybe it will in five, ten years. I don't know when it... Will it become fashionable again to, to be a bit... Uh, to, mm. to have... But, but I have to say that the free speech czar, Arif Ahmed, the professor, has done a fantastic job in it. You know, he made mm. a point of inviting people to Gonville and Keys who were heterodox speakers, right. unconventional speakers, even though the master the, or the person in charge of Gonville and Keys was a, a nightmare authoritarian, basically saying, no, we should... We should we, oh, she was disapproving of Helen Joyce and saying all sorts mm. of terrible, incorrect things about... But he went ahead anyway. So we need people like that. We need academics who will stick their neck out. Yeah, I we think. need a channel. A TV we need channel, a TV channel, a TV news channel, Commit. where we can find out what heterodox means. <laughs> like this one, <laughs> like this one, and we will talk about whatever we want on this channel. That, no, we do need this. Absolutely, we do. Hundred percent. And to all big these people up. that say, "Oh, there's no, uh, there's no restrictions. You can say whatever. Go on, say what you want." It's like, no, you don't know when I feel restricted. That's yeah. a private matter. I'm heterodoxophobic. You're going to have to look this up after this. I will have to after this show. After I read right? your book. I'm not, I'm not... <laughs> have you still not read my book? It's you... been at the bottom of my bag for two years. <laughs> I'm so offended. I'm so offended. Because okay. it's got big words. It's got heterodox in it. I can't it's read a book that's got heterodox. probably written another one since. Josh. You tell me You're what heterodox behind. is and I'll get past that bit and then I'm I can I'm not get telling you any more than I've already told you. We're moving on to the Daily Mail now. Two Israeli brothers uh, subjected to questioning. What's going on here? Yeah, we're leaving Britain today because we don't feel safe. Two Israeli Nova Massacre heroes who were detained by anti-Semitic staff at the Manchester airport return home after interrogation brought back horror of the day they'll never forget. Mm. So this uh, kind of there was a clip online of these two brothers 
coming through customs and a man speaking quite harshly to them. I don't think that was particularly the issue. It was more the fact that they initially, someone went up to them and assumed that they were Muslim. They're Ye Yemeni Jews. Yes. Which said they're dark skinned. Yes. Uh, assumed they were Muslim. As soon as they said that they were actually Jewish, Supposedly their attitude totally changed. Said, "Right, you're gonna to have to wait here. They had to wait for an hour and a half. Really? Someone come. They got interrogated, and this is not on camera. But supposedly one of the border patrol said, "We have to make sure that you're not going to do here what you've been doing in Gaza, which is wow. disgusting. What? Re try and retrieve hostages and defeat rapist terrorists. Anyway, so it's very sad. They came over here." to raise money for Israel um, because there's a lot of displaced people. There's also, in this case, a lot of traumatised people. They were at this October 7th, the, the music festival. Yeah. They were heroes on the day. They saved people's lives. And um, and it's, to hit, to, it's so sad to read what they say about our country, how yeah. they are now convinced that we are a um, anti-Semitic country. And, and of course, like, it's not they everyone. They don't want to come back. It, no. it is like... The, but, but the, it's the, just Manchester. The key, <laughs> the key thing about these things is when something like this happens, when someone goes rogue and allows their personal prejudices to interfere with their day's work, yep. it's how you deal with that. Like, this has to be taken care of pretty, you know, And this robustly. is an official representing the country. Exactly. So it has to be just dealt with. Is it being dealt with, Cressida? Well, it sounds like it is. James Curvely's condemned it. Um, so, you know, that's good. He's ordered an investigation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, my heart sinks when I hear that. Oh, there's going to be an yeah. investigation. But, you know, I don't know. That's good. I don't think the person who, who was being rude to these guys is... It's going to be in a job much longer. Right. I can just, well, I so, don't know, but I assume that's the case. So that's the key thing, isn't it? That it's being yeah, dealt with. Yeah, I think with. so. But you're right, so, Josh. It shouldn't happen. But they happen in Manchester. It. You had the NHS nurses with the yeah, yeah. Palestinian um, on their placard, on their uh, badges, and they kicked some nine-year-old Jewish kid onto the floor. Yes. There's blood treatment. So I think it's. But also they said, oh, we don't feel safe here. But again, I feel like it's Manchester. No one really feels that safe in Manchester. <laughs> Very good point. Uh, if you are in Manchester and you are watching, well, actually, you're probably not watching anymore, are you? Um, let's move on now. The, to the TV's been stolen. Josh Howie. <laughs> OK. Well, We're going to so move I'll on to the... Back. No. I'll take it back. Well, I adore Manchester for a bit of balance. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> I like Manchester as well. I do. You've, I'm you've never okay. been to and Manchester. They just don't book me anymore. <laughs> We're going to move to The Guardian now. Use of Twitter in the US. Falling, apparently? Falling. Twitter usage in US fallen by a fifth since Elon Musk's takeover. Is this just a hit piece on Elon well, Musk? Well, it might be, because it is in The Guardian. They Everyone don't like else... Him. Oh, what a surprise. They don't like the cut of his jib. On the other hand, um, they have shown that, that the... Well, yeah, that it's fallen. As of February 24, the social network's daily app users in America have fallen by 23%. Yeah, but he didn't it. buy but... Twitter for that reason, to make, you know, to bolster the numbers on it. Well, no, quite. That's... You know, it was, a, it was a point about free speech. It was a point about allowing people to talk. Yeah, and, I mean, that's... That's great. And he's also come back and, and sort of said, well, hang on a minute, if you look at the, the daily average time spent on the platform, that's yeah. gone up. It's mostly Josh, obviously. It is um, mostly Josh fighting with yes. uh, left, uh, uh, far left. Yeah, yeah, Islamists and the far left. Yeah. <laughs> You're taking them on by yourself there, Josh. It you is are... a full-time job. So, but, but the thing about Elon's takeover is that, you know, he, obviously he's not making money. Also, he's annoying advertisers. Mm. You know, he's telling them to just... Mm. Well, he swore at them, didn't yes. he, quite openly. Because he's the richest guy in the world, so he can. But but he's made a point about Twitter. I mean, this is the this is why I think Twitter is actually better. But a lot of people, like the Guardian, keep saying hate speech has in increased. I've seen a decrease, quite quite substantially, of of hateful accounts on Twitter. But that's because you blocked everyone. <laughs> that's actually probably all it is. That's probably all probably it is. What it is. Yeah. Uh, I have seen some improvements on it, not to do with the hate speech. It's but then maybe I've just got a sort of tougher hide now. In yeah, a way. yeah, yeah. But the, he overpaid. He paid forty-four billion dollars. Oh, They're bargain. saying it's now worth about twelve billion, but it may well go back up again. But. You can speak freely now. There was censorship on the platform. Undoubtedly. And people were being, uh, what's it, ghosted, whatever it's called. I mean, my, my satirical Shadow. account Shadow got, got kicked whatnot, yeah. off four times. I got kicked yeah. off four times. And, and, and loads of women who said that, you know, there's a difference between men and women got kicked off. Loads of them. Yeah. You know, so satirical accounts got booted. I mean, it was, it was mad and it was ideological. And you now know? we can choose what we want to look at or block, um, which is lovely. Isn't That's it? part of free speech, Cressida. You know, if you're not interested in what someone's got to say, you yeah. block them. But it's I'm you gonna deciding, read a book. not I'm going to read that book. <laughs> right. I don't know if I, yeah. But there is, there's about four people who keep on messaging me saying, could you tell Andrew to stop, to unblock me? Well, if you well, pass I'll on their, those, I will pass, pass them on. on the I names, and I, it, yeah, it, right. it might well be a mistake. It might well be friendly fire. Right, we're going to finish this section with The Guardian now. And the ONS... Office of National Statistics, what's going on here? ONS scraps plans to stop reporting the deaths of homeless people. It's incredible that, that they were going to be doing this. About uh, 741 homeless uh, people died in 2021. Yep. 
Uh, I don't know why they would stop collecting this data, because it's obviously very useful to find out how great a problem is and, and what, well, what the tragedy is. Presumably it's money, well, it, cutbacks. No, I don't think it's that. I think that they just didn't want it to be reported. It, I, yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? I've always have felt that any civilised society should be able to deal with this problem of homelessness. Absolutely. I don't think anyone in a, a prosperous society like us, the world's fifth economy or whatever, should have people sleeping on the street. Can I, I don't just get before Cresta comes in that my mate works for one of these charities proper. As it says here, 35% are al drug poisoning, 30% suicide, 10% alcohol. Yeah. It, there's a real problem. And it isn't just like, oh, here's your flat. Or no, no, no. Oh, there, there are bigger problems. There's a course. lot of mental health issues. There's a lot of issues there. But I do think a country as rich as ours, should, it's a disgrace to see people suffering in this way yeah. out on the streets. I, it really angers me, actually. No. Yeah, no, I mean, so I, it says here that it, there's this idea that it's to increase the efficiency of health data, which is one of those sentences that doesn't really... Yeah. Uh, what? No. Um, I think this is not the thing to be cutting back on. There are other things I can think of. Uh, anyway, that is part two done, so stay tuned. As we're going to be discussing listening lessons at Harvard, Cadbury accused of erasing Easter and why we shouldn't pity working-class people. <laughs> See you in a few minutes. Hi there, time to look at the Met Office forecast for GB News. Rain and hill snow across northern parts of the UK during the next 24 hours. Showers moving in elsewhere, although interspersed by at least some brighter interludes. Low pressure still well and truly in charge. That low mainly sitting towards the southwest of the UK and it is sending a band of rain north during the evening into Northern Ireland where some wet weather could cause issues, rain warning in force, as well as central and northern England parts of Wales and then eventually that rain moves into Scotland where it mixes with cold air to give some snow above two or three hundred metres. The far north stays dry but chilly and further south, some clear spells, although the next area of rain moves in by dawn to affect southwest England, Wales, Northern Ireland as well. Heavy downpours, gusty winds, and then that rain, well, it tends to turn to showers as it moves into central UK by the afternoon. Further showers arrive later from the southwest with gusty winds, hail and thunder. A lively afternoon, although with some pretty clouds in the sky. Now, in the far north, we're going to see wet and windy weather remain until Thursday morning. And then Thursday starts off bright across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, for England and Wales, a blustery start with further heavy rain to come, followed by showers. And those showers developing fairly widely as we go into the uh, Easter weekend, I suspect. Good Friday, Saturday and Easter day. Mostly, we're going to see sunny spells and showers before more prolonged rain on Monday. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners. It's your first look at Wednesday's newspapers. We're going to begin with the Telegraph. Story about the Tories. Who's got this one? Is this you, Chris? Me. Uh, Tories pour cold water on Davies' idea to charge wealthy more for BBC licence fee. So Tim Davies... He's the Director, uh, the Director General. General. He's yeah. had this bright idea. Because, obviously, the BBC are losing 
viewership, listenership, and they're trying to Dominate. plug the gap. <laughs> and what can they do? Uh, and so one of his great ideas is to charge wealthy people more for their licence fees. So I suppose that would have to be means tested. Yes. And the Tories have just said, no, forget it. That won't happen on our watch. Of course, it won't be their watch necessarily much no. longer. But that's... well, how about they go to a subscription service? Or how about they start offering a proper service where they are impartially reporting on the news rather than ignoring the WPATH scandal, the biggest medical scandal of the century, four weeks on and they still haven't mentioned it? I'm sorry, I'm yeah. done with the BBC now. No, it's crazy. I mean, the whole point of the BBC is you're meant to have these, like, heterodox opinions. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to get that word in because you've learned the new I word I learned it in the interval. You told me what it was. It's so not I'm... called an interval. It's a break. Well, OK, break. Sorry. <laughs> it's, we're not the theatre. Goodness anyway, sake. So I like heterodox opinions. Right. And uh, it doesn't feel like you get much heterodoxy None at all. Anymore. Uh, they're saying here that they're, like you should like the news will be free, but we pay for entertainment. I think it should be the other way around. I think the yeah. entertainment. But the problem with the entertainment even is that it's sort of imbued with these uh, ideologies. Yeah, e it, it, even completely. with like Doctor Who and whatnot. So oh, especially with Doctor Who. Doctor yeah. Who is now like Pravda. It's yeah. basically propaganda for the state at this point. Yeah. So, I, but I have. But at the same time, I have obviously a soft spot. I used to work for the BBC. I did my. I had, I had a thing on yeah. Radio Four. They gave me an opportunity, and I'll be forever great for them and I believe they've given they've created great comedy but I don't feel like they've not for a while that, but not for a while yeah, I think the people you're grateful to have gone I don't think yeah they're all no, gone. They, no they have gone and it makes me sad so uh, it's just you know what it is like in my lefty imbued brain it's still like how dare people call for the BBC to not to be defunded and whatnot yeah uh, but then I have a new brain, which is like learnt like words like heterodox, yeah. and then you start going. Well, actually, they're not doing their job. I just want them to be really good. I want them to be making. I, I, Andrew I, said that. I want to be impartial. I want them to be really good. I want them to be impartial. They're just not. They're really, really failing on this. And as for Tim Davy uh, appearing and saying, "Oh, this this trans issue yeah, is yeah. just a cultural nonsense," you know, it's it, it's it's been blown up. No, you don't understand that, and you're not yeah. making an effort to understand yeah. it. Yeah. That's what's going on here. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's. Anyway, yeah. let's move on before I get too enraged. We're going to move on to the Daily Mail now. Harvard University's listening sessions. Yes, Harvard task force to hold listening sessions where community can discuss anti-Semitism as Ivy League school tries to rebound from uh, Claudine Gay's resignation you, in wake of October. You so, might want to remind us what happened with Claudine so Gay. So she was part of a panel of uh, people running universities who were questioned by Congress. But well, she was in charge of Harvard. She was in charge of Harvard, and there was someone from MIT, and, and they were all kind of asked, "Hey, is uh, calling for the genocide of Jews okay?" And they were like, "Yeah, well, you know, depends, depends on the context." On the... Depends on the context. That's what they said. Yeah, um, yeah. and. You know what the answer to that question is? No. Oh, no, yeah. Simple. Pretty, it's, pretty so easy, it's so simple. easy. But then she was discovered to have plagiarised. Well, that's it. So she sort of clung in there for a bit whilst other people had to resign. And, yeah. then, uh, and then it turned out she'd done a lot of sort of scribbling from other sources. Yeah, stealing other people's work uh, for her doctoral thesis. This is yeah. the big no-no that acad all academics know. But then you had like... I'm thick and I knew that. You knew that, and you oh, don't even know what heterodox means. No. But, like, but then you had people like the Associated Press putting out an article saying that accusations of plagiarism are a new racist weapon yeah. because oh. she's not a white person. It's like, no, this has nothing to do with race. Stop making it about race. Oh, also, Black people know not to plagiarise too. How about you're the racist for yes, suggesting that? that's the bigotry of low expectation, as yeah. Candace Owens likes to say. That's Well, that basically, um, th there's been a task force created. They're doing... A, uh, a task force for combating anti-Semitism, and they're also doing a task force combating anti-Muslim and anti-Arab, because you can't defeat anti-Semitism without mentioning anti um, anti It's like Muslims. a weird reflex, isn't it? Yeah. Whenever anti-Semitism... I mean, oh, it's anti-Semitism. Yeah, yeah, but it's fine. Like, no-one's saying that because you're you're trying to tackle anti-Semitism, you don't care about any other prejudices. Of course you... But they have you, to... They, they see it as flip sides of the same coin. It can't just be like... We can't just mention it in its own right. No. I will say to their cred credence... Credence, credence. I don't know. Whatever. To the heterodox, that they are. This task force is called the, of of combating anti-Muslim and anti-Arab. So they didn't go with Islamophobia. I think that's a good step. No, I think I think I'm fine with the phrase anti-Muslim prejudice, which yeah. I think does exist, and we've seen evidence of it. Islamophobia, I think, is a nonsense term that just conflates legitimate criticism of Islam, which is, after all, mm. a belief system, and it conflates it with anti-Muslim prejudice, and that's not yeah. fair on anyone. Yeah. Doesn't help. So they've set aside two weeks for people to talk uh, and about what's basically yeah. been happening on campus. Jews, we like to whine. 
Uh, two weeks is not going to be enough. Anti-Semitism right there. Um, so, Cresta, are you happy with this? Well, I, you... not really. I think you should have a sort of general theory of eth ethics. In, yes. You know, how should everybody be treated? I mean, OK, it's a bit late for that, cos after the Claudine Gay stuff, we, maybe we do need to address that. But, yes. you know, go back a step. Universities should just be a place where everybody has the same... Yeah, Freedom of speech, same rights. Right. Yeah. But that, I think, was the issue, the double standards of that statement. Yes. Insofar as, you know, it's all very well if she was saying, hey, I'm a strict free speech advocate, even if you're calling for the yes. genocide of anyone, then we are totally free speech. But they kick people out for tiny microaggressions who hadn't said anything at yeah. all. That's right, I just so, wanted to mention my university. I went to Goldsmiths University, uh, got in through clearing, and um, today I saw some footage of the cafeteria I used to hang out with, and everybody's in there chanting from the river to the sea. Wow. And I'm thinking, I used to run the Jewish society there, and we had, like, bagel evenings and whatever. I'm just thinking, like, if I was there now, I'd just be dealing with a bunch of terrified students. Yeah. Including some, myself, frankly. It's gotta be, something's got to be done. OK, we're moving on to the Telegraph now. Working class people, Cressida, do you pity them? No, I don't. Don't pity working class people, says Peaky Blinders creator. Who's that then? Well, that's a good question. I've never actually seen it. Um, he's called Stephen Knight, and apparently he is the son of a blacksmith. Um, you know, these people who've got working class parents and then get into the arts and still bang on about their heritage. Isn't Disgusting. a blacksmith quite an affluent job these days? It feels like something you get is. at, like, Borough Market. Yes, you probably go on a retreat to do blacksmithing for yeah, a weekend yeah. and it's fabulous and there's nice wine. That's a very good point. <laughs> um, but here, he's got this romanticism about the working classes. He says, if you live at the top of a tower block, you can see the whole world. You can see the curve of the earth. So he's, he's romanticising it. And he makes a very good point. He said... He's talking about his new project. He says it's still about trying to find the universal in one's own backyard, the human story. And that's what literature and art can do, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. Mm. That's a very beautiful sentiment. Josh, are you yeah. going to say something as beautiful? Uh, you're all right, mate. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to uh, give You've you, already upset Manchester. Give you my Don't, oh. heterodox opinion on this particular Go on, then. Uh, issue here. What is it? Well, no, I, when I'm reading this, it's kind of like I'm reading uh, the uh, lyrics to Common People by Pulp. It is and like it was that. Sort of like, it's like, all right... It's... You're basically embodying... The, the girl in that song, aren't you? Yes. Who wants to be poor, wants to hang out with the... Rough, rough yes. it with, yes. the, with yes. the plebs. Yeah, exactly. Everybody hates that's, the tourists. That's the thing. Cos you, you, you weren't a working-class boy, were you? No, but my <laughs> mum was from a working-class background, so I it sort of passed this down, doesn't it? It's in the Look, DNA. My accent changes wherever I am. I can speak like this, I can speak like that, I can get on with whoever. Exactly. Four by twos. All of that, you've got it all going on. I mean, you were raised in a palace, but that doesn't matter, does it? No, no, exactly. You, no. But, but, but I spoke to the cleaner. Exactly. Yeah, and she took me on weekends you, as well. You did she some, raised me. You did some outreach. Good yeah. for you, Josh. We're going to move on now to this story in The Telegraph about Cadbury's erasing Easter. Oh, oh. We're, so, oh we're seeing erasure of e flags, erasure of hot cross buns, and this is the next thing. Cadbury accused of erasing Easter by selling... Gesture eggs! What a gesture This is the stu most stupid heterodox opinion I've ever <laughs> think I've ever seen here, where they're basically... They're not calling it diabetes eggs or anything. They're gesture eggs, so you give someone a gesture egg, not an Easter egg now. Yes. I've got a gesture egg for you. No, but, but it's I not going to catch on, is it? I think that's what they're doing. They're telling you how to buy their product. Didn't they have a... As a, as a gesture. They had a campaign a while ago with this thing of... Some, I don't know, something like, buy people surprise chocolates, they'll like you, or something almost telling you what how to buy the stuff. I and yes. I think they're saying, oh, look, you could make gesture just draw your colleagues. No, I, but it's not, it's no. not very catchy, is it? And it, it, no. it feels a bit clumsy and weird, a gesture egg. Yeah, no, it's stupid. It but there's a work. guy from Christian Concern saying, if it wasn't for Easter, we wouldn't have a reason for Easter eggs. I would say, of course, they're tied together. I'd say there's a somewhat tenuous connection. Why is he being so literal? How many eggs were there up on Calvary? How many bunnies were there exactly. up there when the people well, were being exactly. I think the Easter eggs sort of predate, don't yeah. they, all that stuff. My favourite part of the story, though, is the, uh, the Cabri have put out a... Um, a statement, or the owners of Cadbury, and they basically use Easter loads of times. They're like, we've got nothing wrong with Easter. Easter we love. We call our things Easter, but Easter is all over the packaging, so it's they doth protest too much. They, they doth, indeed. They have risen they, let's, to the occasion. <laughs> let's move on to this story there. This is The Telegraph. Black Rock boss Larry Fink talking about boomers. Who's got this? Me. Uh, it's crazy for retirement age to be 65, warns world's largest fund manager. So, Larry Fink, chairman and chief executive of BlackRock, is apparently a bit of an authority on these things, so yeah. we should listen, because yeah. people do. Yeah. Uh, and he says, 65 years old originates from the time of the Ottoman Empire. Were Does people it? living... What? 
don't know what it's on about, but nowadays people live into their 90s and that's a very expensive thing to do. Old people are expensive. They are. He's, they have expensive uh, tastes. Well, yeah, they, they do. And Dripping he says, in jewels and mink coats yeah. and things. Nobody's... Yeah, buying them socks for my grandma. There you go. Nobody's, he says nobody's giving enough thought to how we're going to pay for all these old So what's people. he suggesting, that they go on and on? Yeah, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, well, you know what? I've known some people who were forced to retire because they reached a certain age and they weren't happy about it. So, like, some people, mm. for their lives, they need to... I mean, I don't know what I'd do yeah. if I wasn't working. No, I, I plan to work forever. What this really is, though, is uh, a, 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 basically an advert for his to say, invest in me, like, the, oh, say, really? you've got lo loads of money or you baby boomers, invest in me in retirement products. So the whole thing, because I read to the very end, and I like that Lewis Schaefer has many... Lewis, yeah. Lewis Schaefer has many um, catchphrases. I would like my... I would like to have my first catchphrase be, I read the... I read to the end. Yeah, OK. Well, that's no... the first time you've said it. It's the first time I've heard it. OK. It well, might become it might a thing. Grow on you. You're going to okay. have to say it a few more it's times. Just, but you yeah. know how the articles, it just always winds them up where they reveal... It's only in the last sentence yeah. that they go, oh, well, this is what the story's actually about. You know, that's something that Shakespeare does in his sonnets. In the last couplet, he often inverts the meaning of the whole sonnet. I'll tell you a word for it. Right, let's uh, now um, go for another break. But coming up in the final section, the price of Freddo's is going up again. Alan Titchmarch is censored. And uh, is it your own fault if you're overweight? If yes. you're plump, <laughs> you want to stay around and find out. <laughs> GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. The Victoria and Albert Museum in London has been accused of calling the former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher a villain. The caption read, over the years, the evil character in this seaside puppet show has shifted from the devil, which it was originally apparently, to unpopular public figures, including Adolf Hitler, Osama bin Laden and Margaret Thatcher. Well, let's talk to political commentator and housing expert Russell Quirk and former miner David Craddock. Good to see you both this morning. Russell, morning. what do you think? No, of course not. She's probably one of the two best prime ministers that this country's ever had, alongside Winston Churchill. Um, she was a woman of conviction, of proper ideology, and she literally pulled Britain up by its bootstraps. So, uh, no, she's a hero. How do you balance that out against the idea that she did, as Russell said, pull Britain up by the bootstraps. You were the sick man of Europe. We were the sick man of Europe, uh, as Russell says, but uh, her methods were not the means of getting us out of trouble. All she did was turn uh, finance towards the private pocket rather than to services. And as a result, Britain suffered in the long term. It's interesting that you bring that up, though, because um, a lot of people do look at the, the um, sort of perilous state our politics is in at the moment, um, and they, they quote people like Margaret Thatcher. They say, if only we had people who were a bit more like Margaret Thatcher, we wouldn't be in the trouble we're in now. It's just unfortunate she's not around now, because I think she put current politicians to shame, don't you? Yeah, but the, but the, the reality with this, Russell, to do that, she was quite happy to break a lot of eggs... Mm. And, and, sh and she did that without a lot of remorse. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners, your first look at Wednesday's newspapers. I'm Andrew Doyle. Let's begin with the Daily Star. Saudi Arabia has unveiled its first humanoid robot named Sarah. Doesn't sound like a Saudi Arabian name, that. 
I think it's sort of got connotations to the Torah. Oh, that has big, it? big, big yeah, Well, Torah, shows though. what I know. Yeah, a uh, female humanoid robot can't talk about sex or politics because it's illegal, and women mm. don't know much about that stuff anyway. So, uh, apart from Cresta, well, they don't <laughs> get a chance. Company, exactly, yeah. Just like this robot, they don't get a chance to yeah. say it. I don't know. Well, it's it's quite interesting, and but and they've got a bloke one who's guess what he's called. Go on, Mohammed. I, I wasn't going to say it. I was, I, I, you know, free speech channel. Yeah. Uh, and he, but he could sort of, he could do loads of, he could just talk about whatever. He also physically assaulted somebody, allegedly accidentally. Really? A robot? Grabbed someone's Well, bomb. there was a reporter, a female racist. reporter standing in front of him and it looks like he's... Um... So they've been inculcated all sorts of male behaviour into this into this. Well, robot. they're now saying he was just gesticulating. I didn't touch her, Your Honour, that kind of thing. But it's a um, robot. Well, it, yeah, it must yes. have been programmed to do... Although, I, mean, I do think this story isn't just about robots, is it? It's about people. Yes, of course. Presta, does it, does it annoy you to think that they are programming female robots to behave like the kind of women the, the patriarchy would like you to be? Well, it makes me very grateful to be here and not there. Yeah, Andrew. well, that's how it makes me feel. Sure. And not a robot. Yeah. But if I were a robot, I'd be the kind who'd be allowed to um, yep. speak about whatever I like. Yeah, yeah, but it is interesting to see how different co culture. You think of robotics as this kind of uniform idea, but there's a very heterodox vibe in the... Oh, for goodness the, sake. Diff, no, no, I'm just saying genuinely that different cultures will create different kinds of robots. They will indeed. And, and of I, we have AI over here, which is but, taking on but, our ideas. Yeah. Yes. And that's well, why they're all woke. Well, but then there were also some racist ideas that were incorporated. Into with, the robots. Into robots also, and into AI, uh, in terms of recognising different ethnicities' faces. And racist whatnot. robots. Gonna, well, we need to get rid it, of these. But now we're seeing this... Sexist robots. Sexist robots. So yeah. in a thousand years, when there's no people left and it's all just robots, it'll be exactly the same. It'll be the same. Yeah. They'll be having the same That's argument. I think we probably are robots. Oh, what, already? Yeah, we could well be robots. OK. I'm not even going to entertain that. OK. Let's move on to the Daily Mail now. Sorry, Ofcom. And if you're overweight, it's your fault, apparently. Yeah. Um, so Nick Ferrari sparked a furious debate as he claimed it's always someone's own fault if they're overweight. So this is the British TV presenter, who's 65, it says here. Um, and he's been, gratuitous. Well, they're trying to age shame. Uh, unnecessary, isn't it? Um, he's been on this morning and he's upset everybody by saying that if you're overweight, it's your fault. That's well, not a fashionable opinion. Well, look, it can be your fault if you eat a lot of cakes and pies, but it can also not be your fault if you... You know, there, there, are, there are reasons why people gain weight easier than other people. Uh, it's true. True, Josh. I mean, I mean, yeah, maybe, but it doesn't matter. You, look, I keep, I've been, I'm, me, I'm dieting. You know, as soon as I stop eat, eating it's like rubbish and whatever, then I put on weight, and when I stop eating it, I lose weight. Yeah, but that might be the way your body reacts. That's the way don't, every that's single not, body reacts. Not necessarily. Everybody's right to a degree. Now it might be easier, harder. Yeah, sure. But the reality is, if you want to lose weight, you can lose weight. So you have no sympathy for very large people. Yes, I have sympathy. No, actually. <laughs> You're just <laughs> like know. Nick Ferrari on this. I, I think I am. I mean, yeah. look, we hear the other side so much. It's nice to hear somebody being a bit strict, isn't it? It's, well, it comes down to willpower. I'm not saying that's hard. They're talking here about people who are being abused and... Yeah, some people have really tough lives. But, but now you've got 64% of adults, British adults, including myself, being overweight. And it's a problem, and it's costing us billions in the, for the NHS. We are talking about for earlier about NHS. You know, this, if everybody was eating less and exercising yes. more, we wouldn't have all these waiting times. Maybe we bring back rationing. <laughs> Well, I don't think we've got any choice. Be yeah. careful what you wish for. Yeah. I think that's going to be happening anyway. Isn't Maybe it? it'll happen. Let's move on now to the Independent. This is uh, Easter eggs costing more money. Well, it's making us actually be. Uh, it's not Easter. Yeah. So, price of a Freddo has gone up again and is unlikely to bounce any time. Remind me of what so a Freddo, Freddo is. Freddo is a little uh, frog. Uh, it's like a little piece of chocolate that. that it's shaped like a frog. Like a yeah. frog. Why yeah. would you want to eat a frog? Because it's cheap and you don't want a full chocolate bar. Yeah. Like, oh, I want a Freddo, which was normally... Well, it used to be, like, 10p. So, isn't this... Uh, this is good for you because you think we're well, all too fat. fat. Yeah, exactly. So, make, now make chocolate more expensive. It's gone up. It's now, it's, it, now it's gone up to 36p, so I can't afford it anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's also good news for cocoa growers because apparently they're all very small. It's not, like, a very modernised they... industry. Yeah. No, but Why the, are they so, so small? Well, because they haven't invested in their poor and one thing and another. And I think... Do you remember there was that move to have free... Fair trade, not free trade, yeah. fair trade, yes. yeah. cocoa. Um, so, that if it's... If the demand is outstripping the supply, that's got well, to be good. We've got a real problem time. with chocolate. The, the yes, cocoa we... bees. We, we, we are, yeah, because uh, in Ghana and the Ivory Coast, there's been a bunch of. There was like a big loads of rain, and then it was uh, loads of heat yeah. and uh, drought. I believe is the technical heterodox term. And 
but there's a real shortage of cocoa. It's gone up like 150%. That's just this year. It, it was, it, it's gone up. Uh, last year, it was uh, $2,600. Yes. And now it's $10,000. You're the, getting very despite, agitated, I'm just Josh. saying, we need to stockpile some chocolate. You, you, it sounds like you've had a lot of chocolate tonight, so I'm just <laughs> going to rain this in. Coffee and caffeine and sugar. Buy chocolate let's, now. Let's move on to The Guardian. Alan Titchmarsh has been censored. Cressida, that's not good. Well, Alan Titchmarsh's jeans blurred by North Korean TV censors. His what? His jeans. His jeans? Well, jeans are banned in North Korea because they represent the West and uh, America uh, and all that stuff. Like cowboy type Yes, thing. Kim Jong-un's not into any of that. They've been banned since the early 1990s. Yes. So Titchmarsh is thrilled that his career's taking off there. But it turns yeah. out he's kind of a... a strange thing to yeah. censor, though. The jeans. Well, it's what it means to them, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a cultural difference. What do you think, Josh? Well, I think uh, it's interesting that, as you say, that it's become, it is so popular out there, but they steal it from us. It's a BBC programme, we pay for it with our fee, and they just basically steal it and put it out, yes. and we're not getting any money of that. They're not giving us any money back. We need to sue them. Josh, can you do this last story in 30 seconds? This is the Daily Star, Joey Barton. Yes, Joey Barton reaches new low with shameless sexist taunt over the Baltimore bridge collapse. Uh, this was the boat that went into the bridge. Yes. Obviously, he's basically said that a it's disgustingly sexist that a, a, a had a woman driver which is ridiculous they're not going to let any woman captain a boat so that would be stupid yeah so it? um Shut up, that's, Josh. that's what I'm, but there are some serious implications here Cresta say what you were saying before it sounded clever uh what was I saying before in 30 <laughs> the black, seconds the black swan effect yes, is going to have ruin a knock on the effect there's a lot of conspiracy theories starting online already there's people saying ah that wasn't a, an authentic accident dun 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 have a look on YouTube I mean I've seen the crack it's pretty scary stuff it just goes straight it's into the bridge the idiots. whole thing falls yeah uh, you know I'm I 20 wait. cars on the bridge at really the time. yeah it's, it's was anyone really, hurt yes Oh. It's, it's now a recovery this of... Oh, it's dark. Absolutely horrible and dark. And what a way to end what the show. What a way to finish. <laughs> what a note to <laughs> end the show out. on. Well, look, the show is unfortunately nearly over, so let's take another quick look at Wednesday's front pages. So The Telegraph is leading with churches undermining asylum system. The Guardian has CBI stops staff discussing sexual misconduct and bullying claims. The I is running with state pension age may rise to 68 sooner to pay for triple lock pledge. And The Daily Mail is leading with Clapham chemical attacker asylum Fiasco. The Financial Times has Trump's social <laughs> media group jumps 50% on Nasdaq market debut. And the Mirror Traitors, the Brits fighting with Putin. So that's all we've got time for. Thanks so much to my guests, Josh Howey and to Cressida Wetton. We are back tomorrow. Heterodox. Shut up, Josh. When Simon Evans will be joined by Stephen Allen and Francis Foster. And if you're watching at 5 a.m. right now, please do stay tuned because now it's time for breakfast. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, time to look at the Met Office forecast for GB News. Rain and hill snow across northern parts of the UK during the next 24 hours. Showers moving in elsewhere, although interspersed by at least some brighter interludes. Low pressure still well and truly in charge. That low mainly sitting towards the southwest of the UK and it is sending a band of rain north during the evening into Northern Ireland where some wet weather could cause issues, rain warning in force, as well as central and northern England parts of Wales and then eventually that rain moves into Scotland where it mixes with cold air to give some snow above two or three hundred metres. The far north stays dry but chilly and further south, some clear spells, although the next area of rain moves in by dawn to affect southwest England, Wales, Northern Ireland as well. Heavy downpours, gusty winds, and then that rain, well, it tends to turn to showers as it moves into central UK by the afternoon. Further showers arrive later from the southwest with gusty winds, hail and thunder. A lively afternoon, although with some pretty clouds in the sky. Now, in the far north, we're going to see wet and windy weather remain until Thursday morning. And then Thursday starts off bright across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, for England and Wales, a blustery start with further heavy rain to come, followed by showers. And those showers developing fairly widely as we go into the uh, Easter weekend. I suspect Good Friday, Saturday and Easter day. Mostly we're going to see sunny spells and showers before more prolonged rain on Monday. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be 
as happy as I was. And they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter our massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Glory De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring.